H&M and David and Georges are uh, machine learning engineers. So you will learn directly from the best. The stage is yours and uh, have fun. Thank you, Christine. And uh, welcome everybody to this uh, Zero to Hero tutorial on uh, deep learning, where we will uh, analyze classification tasks with uh, an uh, increasing degree of complexity. So we will have uh, part one, which is uh, classification of a small synthetic data set. Then we will uh, move to part two, where we will classify garments starting from their images. So it's one of the classic um, computer vision tasks, be able to classify images. And then we will go part three, where we will uh, study classification applied to data with a graph structure. So we go to a very, I would say, to a quite complex thing to do. And uh, what I would like to point out now in this introduction is that uh, the workshop will not present you only how to solve the, the tasks, the classification tasks, but also how to structure a code base for such a deep learning project uh, according to software development best practice. And uh, regarding this, I would like to spend two minutes talking about the philosophy behind this tutorial which is pretty much the way of working we have at uh, H&M Group uh, AI Research. That is where uh, uh, I, George, and uh, David work. We won't go very deep into that, but I will just summarize our principles with two pictures. So the first one is uh, about uh, what we consider as outputs for uh, industrial AI research projects. Possible outputs are like uh, scientific paper, thesis, both at a master and a PhD level, presentation and demos, and uh, this is not much to discuss about. This is the classics. But what we also believe is that working software is uh, an output of a research problem or project of paramount importance. So we don't believe on the fact that we should just be fast. You know, we are research. They will code it well later. We believe that we need to code it right from day one, because uh, if uh, the time from when we are done with research to when it's possible to actually test in some sort of real uh, ML pipeline is too big, then uh, nobody will uh, overtake, uh, undertake the effort of doing it, and then our results will be lost. And then uh, the second, uh, this, this brings us to why we have a focus on software good practices in this uh, tutorial. And then the other side of it is the agile methodologies, like the way that this tutorial is organized, like going from something um, relatively simple to something hard in a controlled step uh, of increasing complexity. So being agile for us doesn't really mean that we do all the so-called agile ceremonies like stand-ups every day, retrospective, uh, but we just try to apply the basic principles of agile that are very close to what the Newton Galileo scientific, scientific method actually is. Have an hypothesis, test it, decide how to go forward and try to do this as quickly as possible. If you're interested in more detail about this, uh, I have uh, uh, written a four minutes uh, blog post on Medium. You can find the link here in this uh, uh, notebook. And uh, before starting off with the three parts of the tutorial, I would like to give the word to George for a second that will show you around in the repo where uh, this tutorial is hosted so that you can kind of have an idea of the overall structure where uh, then the tutorial will go and pick files from. So George, please go ahead with uh, describing the repo. Hello everyone. Um, this is the, the repo and uh, probably the link will be shared uh, later. And I want to show you the structure of the repo. So before starting with the structure, I want to show you how 
we generated this specific structure. And probably from people that have experience with different uh, repositories, we can see that some parts are things that are repeated every time. For example, a git ignore file, a make file, etc. So for generating these repos and in the same structure every time, we use PyScaffold. PyScaffold is a project which generates Python uh, oriented uh, projects in such a way so we always have the same structure and it also release, it reduces a lot of the common parts that we need to copy paste or redo every time. And the PyScaffold project can, uh, we can configure it so we can create different uh, templates so we can reuse again and again. For this specific uh, case, I used one of the PyScaffold templates uh, extension, sorry, which is called Data Science Project to generate this uh, uh, this project. And as you can see, we got a configuration directory where under the configs, we can see the different uh, YAML files for each uh, independent part that we're going to see. We have the data. This is something that will be ignored and just host the data uh, when we run something. Uh, the documentation, the scripts, which run the different parts, the source codes, and the, some unit tests. And then there's a code or the, some files which just uh, are used again and again for uh, between different projects. For example, how to ignore things, uh, pre-commit. This is something that uh, I explain uh, extensively in the readme file. So if you follow the instructions, you can reproduce what we are going to see today. And here, there are also Google Collab notebooks for more interactive uh, action. And all of these are generated every time uh, from PyScaffold, so we can reduce uh, much of the workload. And I give back the word to Marco. Thank you, George. And uh, here, uh, like, uh, you get the link to the repo here in the, in the intro notebook. And uh, so you can already see how our uh, quest for reproducibility already start from the choice on how we actually create our projects, which is try to standardize, try to write as little boilerplate code as possible and try to focus on the data science part, which is the, the one that is going to create the most business value for us. And uh, with this said, I think we can start with uh, part one of the tutorial, which is the classification of a small synthetic data set. And uh, I'll give the word uh, back to George for this. Yes, thank you very much. So in the part one, uh, we're going to see how we can classify, as Marco said, uh, a synthetic data set. The synthetic data set is generated uh, through sklearn uh, and this we generated some gaussian blobs gaussian blobs being just uh, some data points in the space with uh, some uh, gaussian distribution and uh, for this part we're going to use an mlp multi-layer perception to classify the the blobs and for doing that uh, our implementation will be done in pytorch and uh, specifically we're going to use the pytorch lightning wrapper so what is PyTorch Lightning and why do we use PyTorch Lightning? PyTorch Lightning is a framework, a deep learning framework, which um, re re uh, removes a lot of the boiler part, uh, bo boilerplate uh, from the code that we have to do again and again in the different uh, deep learning projects, which just reuse a lot of code. And another thing that is very important from PyTorch Lightning is that it gives a very a clean and uh, same structure for all the different deep learning projects. So what we are going to see to the different parts is that from a very simple case, like the one that we are going to present in part one, until part two and part three, we have exactly the same structure, the same, the same way to do everything, and then we just change uh, independently some parts. So we can just focus on the important part. Here you can see how a uh, PyTorch Lightning structure works or how it looks. So first we have to initialize the model. Then we have to uh, prepare the data. And then we have a trainer which can train or feed the model on the data set, choose the best model on the validation data set. And then we can use the same trainer to test on a, uh, on a new data set, which is unknown during the training. Here we have some links which can take you to this specific 
uh, code parts of uh, of this part. And now we're going to see this. So if let, you let me click on the first one and all of them actually, we can dive more. So first we need to check how the data works, how the data look. So PyTorch Lighting, since we talk about PyTorch Lighting, PyTorch Lighting has a, um, has a module called Data Module, which we inherit. And from inheriting it, we can just overwrite a few methods, which we can uh, specify based on our preferences and our uh, case. So one of them is the init. So we need to initialize the module. And then we have the setup, which setup uh, takes a stage where the stage means uh, if the mod, if uh, if the data set that will return is uh, something for training, validation, test, or predict, these are the options. If it gets on on, it means that it will run for all of them. Uh, fit uh, is where we will train. Validate is where we validate. Test is where we test the model and predict is something that we use a lot when we go to inference and production runs where we have to try to see what will happen on uh, unseen data without targets. Because usually on the previous ones, you have targets. Otherwise, you cannot um, create a metric to know how the model behaves and how the model performs. So the next thing that we need to create in the PyTorch Lighting is the data loaders. So we have to create a train data loader, a validation data loader, test, and predict data loader. So from these parts, uh we, we create the data sets and then the data sets will be fed to the data models uh, sorry to the data loaders and this is just following the basic pytorch uh data set and data loader structure so what we do we just create a small uh data set in pytorch so this pytorch data set contains a need which initialize we need to always know the size of the data set so we have to compute the length and then we have uh, the get item method, which just provides us with the next item. And this is the data set that we call inside the setup. So you see, we call it for train, valid, test, and predict based on the different data that we have generated. Then we have the model part. On the model part, again, we use light, uh, lighting, uh, PyTorch Lighting for having the same uh, structure between all the projects. So the PyTorch Lighting uh, module, which is the one which we use for model, has again some methods which we need to override. Uh, we start with the init, where we initialize the, the model, as you see here. We define some, for example, uh, uh, loss function. And uh, what we can do, we can just uh, save hyperparameters and uh, create a, an example input. But this is for later, we're going to see that uh, in more detail. Then we have the forward, which is the one that actually runs uh, the forward pass of the model, like how we predict or how, what the output of the model comes from this specific uh, forward function. We need to determine some optimizers. In this case, we use Adam. There are other optimizers uh, in the deep learning literature. And then we uh, have... George, uh, sorry yeah. a second. Could you please zoom a bit? Because uh, I think yes. it's hard to read for. Is it better? Yes. Of course. Thank you very much for that. So, yes, we have the optimizers. And then we have the training step, which uh, we have the training step, validation step, test step, and predict step. So, these steps are the steps that called in from the trainer in the different stages. So, in the training step, as you see, we receive a batch, which consists of the data and the targets. And then we get the output by calling the, the forward pass. Then we compute the losses. And then from that, uh, if, if we want, we can uh, also uh, estimate some predictions or do some metrics uh, without the need of uh, gradients. So we can do that for uh, memory efficiency and speed efficiency. And then we can return a dictionary with this information. So if we go to the validation step, uh, it's exactly the same. That's why we just call the training step. We don't have to do something different. The only difference comes in the prediction step because in the prediction step, we don't have any more uh, targets. So the, ba the batch is the data. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the prediction step, when we go for inference or production runs, we just 
take out the probabilities from uh, what we predict, and then we can return the predictions and the probabilities. Uh, the reason that, as you saw earlier, in the training step, we return a dictionary is because this data, this data that we host here in the dictionary, are data that we can use to evaluate the, uh, to aggregate, the, uh, aggregate and evaluate the total metrics. For example, if I want to know the total uh, metric, uh, the total loss uh, during the one epoch. So what we have for that is Python's writing supports with some uh, callbacks, like the training epoch end, where it is called after each epoch. And what we get, we get the output, which is the dictionary return and generated from the training step. And then we can compute the metrics. And then based on our favorite uh, logger, we can uh, save our uh, metrics. In this case, we use TensorBoard and then we're going to see how this look. So for this uh, specific example, I have added something extra, which is um, some images just to see how the model predicts in the, in the space. So this part will just uh, support this, uh, how you, we can see the different images and how we can see the classifier in the space. Before going to that part, I want to show you the trainer. So in PyTorch Lighting, uh, we have a trainer where it can receive a lot of callbacks and we can, can receive some callbacks which are already given by uh, PyTorch Lightning, or we can create our own callbacks. In this case, uh, we use uh, the, the callbacks generated by PyTorch Lightning. And then, as you see, the only thing that we need to define is which device we want to use, uh, the number of epochs. These parameters comes from the configuration file, the logger that we want to use, if we want, in this case, we use TensorBoard and then some other callbacks like early stopping, which avoids the model to be overwritten, and the checkpoint callback, which is one of my favorites um, because it can automatically for you save the model uh, at each uh, step, which has been improved. And uh, every time that you want to run something, it will just uh continue from there for example if you want if you run a new one it will just create a new one but if you want to continue it will automatically find where it stop and it will continue from there so i like that one very much personally and some very uh, few words for the for the callbacks like for the example the model choke point i need to say specify that i want to choose the best model for example with respect to the validation lo uh, sorry log uh, check create a checkpoint for the best mo for the model based on the validation laws in this case it's a minimization task so in uh, every time that i get a smaller validation loss which means better uh, performance then I save a new version now let's go and see how uh, these things looks in the um, in the in the notebook so first of all here we have some uh, libraries that you need to install so uh, first it will print uh, the CUDA version, means if you have a GPU and you want to run in GPU, you can get the CUDA version from here and then you can adjust the, the, um, the libraries accordingly so you can run on a GPU. Then we have the clone and, uh, of, the, of the repo and the installation of it. So what we do, we just clone the repo and install it. And after that, we can import the necessary packages for running the, the specific project, the specific part. So what you see here is just importing the different par, uh, packages. So first we need to read the configuration, we need to define the data, we need to define the model, and then we get the, the, the trainer. And of course we have to uh, ignore or make compatible TensorBoard with uh, PyTorch and Google Lab. And after that, one of the most important tasks in uh, research is reproducibility. So what we need to do is to seed everything, make everything deterministic in, in somehow, so we can always get the same results and know what uh, when we get uh, better or worse performance for something, to know what caused it, and not uh, because of some randomness uh, behavior. Now we are going to see the same structure that we saw in the on the top where here. So we're going to see the same structure as that one. So what we see is that first, we need to read the configuration. Then we need to initialize the data set with the data module, then uh, determine, define the model, 
and then get the, the trainer with the different callbacks. Um, if you remember in the data module earlier, we said that there's a stage which is called, and then the stage will be called with train, uh, sorry, fit, validate, test, and predict. Uh, in this simple example, uh, PyTorch Lighting uh, will take care of all of that and it will call it uh, for us every time. So in this case, in this example that I run, as you see, I use a GPU. The GPU was available and I use it. And uh, here we're going to see how we train the model. So for training the model, we just need to call dot feed on, uh, on which model and on which data set. Since we say data module, PyTorch Lighting again, we'll go and find which one is the training data data loader and then the validate data loader and it will take care of all of these parts. And here I want to show you what's happening uh, inside. So first, when we call it, that a module will have to run the first time and will create the training data, the validate data, the test data and the predict data. So here we'll create uh, two labels, zero, one, for uh, in this center, one, one and minus one, zero. I chose 2D for, uh, so it can be easier later to visualize them. Here you can see the number of, uh, of samples and the dimensions of the features. And we do the same thing for validation test and predict with uh, smaller data. Then we can see how uh, the model looks. So we have the criterion, which is the uh, loss function. We have the MLP, the multi-layer perception, which takes uh, 10 parameters, outputs two, takes two, and then outputs uh, one, uh, sorry, it, it outputs two, which is uh, softmax, and then with the softmax, we can take the argmax. So, yes, and then we, Patrick like provides us with some parameters information, like uh, numbers. I think you can also give, get more detail if you want. And then we can see uh, that uh, it's trained. I trained it for 500 epochs and then we print the best uh, checkpoint. Now we want to test our model and predict on new data. So for testing the model, we can just call the test and then we say which model. So the model is the same, but it will take the best model, the best checkpoint, and we give the data module. So it will automatically find how to do it on the test part. Where we go in inference, which the production part, well, then we have to call uh, the predict step. So again, we specify the model, the data, the best model, and then we want to return the prediction so we can use them for the other tasks that we want or to recommend something or to predict something or to do whatever the model has to do. And what you can see here is that, um, here is that we see that the model performed very well it's a very simple data set. That's why it performs so well. Like it managed to predict everything correct, but uh, the loss was not uh, absolutely correct, but it is something very uh, satisfied. And then we can see for the next data, I just chose, I think eight, yes, eight uh, different uh, random points in the space. And then what happened is that it uh, classified the first uh, as uh, zero and then the other ones as ones. Actually, yeah, eight positive and eight, and neg sorry, eight from label zero and eight from label one. So eight from here and eight from here and then classify them correctly as we see. Now I want to show you uh, how we can monitor the training, how we can see what's happening during the training and how we can see all these uh, results in a better way. First of all, there is uh, in TensorBoard, there is a graph uh, part. And I mentioned earlier when I show you the model that there is an example input array. So this example input array just provides to the tensor board something so we can be, we can be tracked and we can see how the model looks. So in this case, it's very simple. We have an input, we have the blob classifier and then the output. And if I double click on the blob classifier, you see that that one consists of an MLP. And because this is a very simple case, I just created a, a, a linear layer, a simple linear layer. And then we can check also the weights and the bias inside that part. Then let's see how the model was uh, done. Actually, for this part, I have a better, yeah, here. So here we can see how the model uh, performed. So what we can see is that after almost uh, 100 epochs, the model has already achieved a very good performance. And then uh, also 
the loss was still improving, so we didn't overfeed. And we can see how the accuracy looks and the loss looks. Now I prepared something for you where it will uh, demonstrate how the model learns. So here we can see the training data. Let's focus on the training part first. So this is the training data, the uh, red and um, purple. And on the step 15, the model decided that the different blobs have to be classified like this. But at each training step, like every 15 steps, you see that the model improves the decision line, the boundary line. So it becomes better and better. And then what we do, we choose the best model with respect to how the model perform on the validation data set. So if I sc scroll here, you see that we choose the model that behaves best on this data set. So we can avoid the overfitting. And later we can just test on the, on the unknown data, on the unseen data. So before giving the, the word back to, to Marco, I would like to uh, spend one minute to show you that under the, under the uh, okay, I have not run it now, but under the configs, which uh, David will explain further in more detail, you can choose different architectures and different data sets. So what I did, I created another data set which uh, has seven uh, centers with two dimensions and another data set that has uh, five centers with six dimensions, each of them. And then you can just uncomment and comment different places so we can try with different architectures and uh, different uh, data sets. And I want to show you what you should uh, see when you run it. So if I just use another version which I run, here you see that the model in the beginning was predicting like this. So here we have seven centers and then each uh, after a few training steps, the model was improving, improving, and then it learned to classify like this. And then we chose the best model again. It was behaving differently and differently in each step. And then we chose the best model with respect to that one. And then we classify at the end that one. And that's all from the part one. And uh, give the word back to Marco. Thank you, George. Very nice uh, introduction. And as we could see in this uh, part one, we kind of set the stage for the next two parts by introducing uh, PyTorch Lightning, which is the framework we use to kind of uh, keep uh, a constant and uniform code structure across projects. We have seen uh, TensorBoard, a very good tool for uh, monitoring uh, learning uh, algorithms. And now we will go to part two, where uh, David will show, how, will show us how to perform a classification of uh, clothes, of garments from uh, images, going a bit more in depth into the usage of TensorBoard and introducing us some new concepts. Please, David, go ahead. Thank you. So welcome to the second part of the tutorial. So now that we have all of the boilerplate and the infrastructure in place, we will sort of showcase how you can uh, have an easier time scaling to more complex applications with the same sort of code base. So this is still using the same code built in PyTorch Lightning, but we've modified some parts so it works with this new use case. And this part, we will focus on image classification and we will do this with the publicly available data set Fashion Eminist. And this consists of 70,000 grayscale images depicting uh, different clothings, uh, clothing articles from the online retailer Salando. And the clothes are, or our task rather for this tutorial will be to train a network that can classify these grayscale Im images into different clothing types, such as t-shirt, trouser, coat, or different types of shoe wear. And to do this, we will use a new type of a neural network called convolutional neural networks or CNNs. And the reason that we do this is because since image classification is a computer vision task, uh, CNNs have sort of been the standard or the bread and butter in how you solve computer vision tasks for a while now. And that's because you can use much more compact and more scalable models uh, with uh, the sort of component of convolutional neural networks called convolutional layers. And this compared to multi-layer perceptron networks will yield networks that are more powerful with fewer amounts of parameters. So I have an example of 
how one of these layers could work here uh, if you haven't seen a convolutional layer before where we have an image in green which is just a 2d array and it has some values and then you have this convolutional layer which has a kernel which is uh, in yellow here with a set of weights that is sliding across the the image and then for every position it is calculating some sort of convolved feature that you can see here in red and using this you will get some sort of feature encoding that you can then do sequential convolutions on to sort of distill the network. And you could sort of think of it like that this kernel is looking in the image for certain patterns. And then you can sort of construct more and more complex patterns with sequential convolutional layers. And using this, you can sort of create uh, embedding spaces. And I have an example here of an embedding space from the Salando Research GitHub for fashion evanists, and it might look confusing at first, but what it, this essentially is that each picture here or each sprite picture is just uh, an image marking the coordinates where that article of clothing ended up in this feature embedded space where you can sort of inspect how the network is doing when it's uh, sort of grouping and separating different types of clothing. So for example, you can see, if you look at the edges of this sort of cloud, you can see that it's mostly Clothing, uh, clothing articles of one type. So over there, you saw some shoes and you can see some pants or upper body garments uh, in this uh, picture. All right, and we will show you later on in this tutorial how you can use this to sort of increase the explainability and visualizing uh, how, to, how the network is doing. So we will get started with uh, just installing the requirements. I have already run the notebook, so it should uh, already have all the requirements installed, but it's good to do it nonetheless. And then eventually we will, this is all the same code as uh, George showed in the first part, by the way, where you can see yeah, that we use, we check the version of CUDA, we install, in this case, just the CPU, uh, CPU uh, compatible libraries. Then we will clone the zero to hero repo and we will pip install it. And this should already be done, but so we can move on. And we will do the same sort of boilerplate with importing and filtering away warnings, making compatible changes on the back end, and then seeding everything. All right. And then we would usually go on to read the configuration, but I want to stop here and have a look at the code. Because now that we have all of this infrastructure in place, we are now quite free in how we want to experiment with different configurations of our like our data or our networks or maybe how we're training the model. So I've included some path here where you can look in. So if you're using Collab, you can see uh, the, the zero to hero folder here. And then you can go to, for example, configs and we can have a look at the fashion MNIST config here. So here you can see that the config is split into three major parts. And this is a YAML file. Uh, so you can see that we have one part for data. We have one part for the model and one part for the hyperparameters. And using these, we can sort of configure how we want to train or test our network. So for example, data here, one of the more relevant parts is the val split parameter, which will uh, decide how much of, like the relative portion of your data set that will be split into a validation data set that you will use to keep track of how your model is doing during, during training. And on the model part, you can specify some different parameters. So you can see that we have three parts here, which is a convolutional part, we have a pooling part, and we have a linear part. And within these, you can see that we have, for example, in the convolutional part, some additional parameters, which are lists. And what this does is that we can specify the number of convolutional layers in this way by adding new entries to these lists. Uh, so for example, here, out channels is essentially how many we look at this example here, it's how many kernels each layer will have. So one convolutional layer does not need to only have one uh, kernel, you can have several. So in this case, you will have five kernels for the first layer. And if we look at, for example, kernel size, this will decide how big this kernel will be. So in this case, we are ha having a seven here. This will result in a seven by seven uh, feature kernel or convolution kernel. And then we have CNN dropout, which is a functionality to sort of reduce complexity within your model uh, to try to improve performance and make it more robust. And the way that it does this is it um, stochastically turns off some 
activations within your network. So the network doesn't rely on overly complex combinations of the activations to, to predict. And uh, this usually makes it more rely on more robust combinations. Uh, then you have a pooling part, which reduces the size of your feature space. You have a linear part, and this is just like MLPs. And you can see here that we have the out features. And the out features are essentially how many neurons you have in your MLP. And you can see in the first layer here, we have 70. And in the second, we have 10. And this will be the last layer. So we, for example, here in dropout, which is similar to the CNN dropout, we will not apply any dropout here at the final layer. And then we have the hyperparameters config, which, uh, as George talked about before, on sort of the code backend, uh, how we can control that. So we can control how long we train for, how many epochs. We can control the patients. So when we're tracking this uh, with this early stopping callback, we're tracking how the validation loss performs. And if it's not improving within the amount we specified here, so here it's 10 epochs, for example, we will stop the training early. Uh, we can also specify the batch size. We will specify the learning rate and then weight decay for those who are not familiar is a sort of additional term to the loss function uh, to make the model even more robust as we usually do. It's quite a common theme in uh, deep learning. And what this does is that we basically add this term to the loss function where we sum all of the weights in the network. And then we multiply this with this parameter, which will be one, uh, yeah, one to the power of, 1e e minus 4, basically. Uh, so we don't want it to be too too big because then it will dominate the loss function. But having this will sort of reduce the complexity of your model so you don't have large amount or large values on your weights. And then num workers and pin memory, if you're familiar with PyTorch Lightning, is some more infrastructure parameters. So num workers is how many distributed workers you have in the backend for data loading. And pin memory has to do with how you assign memory. And so if you're familiar with PyTorch Lightning, maybe you could play around with this too. But if you're doing this for the first time, I would encourage you to play around with these uh, first ones and like the architecture of the model and maybe a bit on the validation split. Uh, one example is that maybe you would like to reduce this validation split if you're doing this on Colab, because we found that rendering the embedding space when you have 20% of your data's validation will take a long time because then you have to render 10,000 images in this embedding space and that can take a long time. But if you're running locally, it should be fine. Uh, and the, of course, if you're ever unsure of how, this, uh, conf how these configurations are used, you can always go to the code. So if we go to the source repo here, so for example, if you're doing this the first time, I would actually encourage you to go through this config and look at, okay, data, then maybe I should go into the data folder to see uh, how the code, how the configs is read in the code, and it should be quite straightforward. So, or you should actually go here. But if you go through the model, we can have a look at how it looks here. You can see that you have this fashion MNIST classifier object, and you can see that we read a config, and then for each part of the network, so we will initialize a CNN part where we will uh, give as input the re relevant uh, config configurations and we will do the same for the pooling layer and the linear layer and then we have some other callbacks specified here so for example we have this embedding space uh, callback added here that you can that will essentially store the the embeddings so for example if you're even if you don't if you see this and you're still not sure you could also look at the cnn object here and you can look where that's uh, imported from you can see that it's from the models dot uh, pi folder or file here where we have some common functionality so an mlp was used in the previous part of the tutorial and we will use mlp and cnn in this part and we will use even more in the next part but i won't give too many spoilers on that so here we have the cnn and you can see that when we are in initializing these convolutional layers we are basically extending a list uh, you have this CNN layers list. We're extending it using a zipped iterator. So for something that might happen that might surprise you is if you just increase one of the list entries in the config, then you won't, won't get a new layer. You have to have the same number of entries into the list, or into all of the lists for it to work. Uh, and then you can also see that we don't just add a convolutional layer. We add a batch norm layer, an activation layer, 
and some drop yeah the dropout layer so this is what will when you give the dropout value in the config this is what we will feed it to right so now you have some good understanding of what happens on the back end and how to control your experiment with the config so we will move back to the notebook and we will start the training so we will read the config and then we will start to fit the model so you will see here that it starts. You can see that we have a cross entropy loss function in the model summary. We have CNN layers, which are type CNN. And you can see that we have around 1,600 parameters for this. Uh, we have a pooling layer and we have some linear layers that are multi-layer perceptrons. And you can see that they are around 13,000 parameters. And this sort of illustrates the power of convolutional layers is that you can uh, basically get a lot of performance with a few amount of parameters compared to MLPs. And since now we're running on quite small images, it, it's sort of, you don't see it as much, but when you scale the image size, the MLPs will really scale in a not quite ideal way compared to the CNNs. And you can see now that we've trained for one epoch, you can see that it takes around 40 seconds. And if we would train this model now until it finishes, it would take quite a long time. It takes around 38 epochs, so it's 38 times 40 seconds for it to finish. Uh, but to spare you guys just hearing me rambling on until we finish the training, I have I will just uh, show you how it looks when the training is finished. But if you're doing this on your own, I encourage you guys to, to try this out yourself. You can also test the model. And I won't run this either because what we've included in this model with the embedding callback, every 20 epochs during training, we will store the feature embeddings. And when we test the model, we will also store the embeddings. And this takes quite a long time. So for example, when you're running the testing, it takes a minute here. And that's because it takes a long time to store the embeddings. Uh, so if you're doing this on your own, please go ahead and do it. But uh, just to spare you guys from seeing me watch a progress bar, I, I won't do it here. But let's say we've done all of this and we want to inspect what we, what we got from the training and the testing. We're going to use our trusty tensor board to see how we did. Uh, so we'll load our instance here. And it should uh, load, it takes a little while. And there we go. And some of the modules that we will be using here is time series. We will use graphs and projector. So time series is good if you want to track your accuracy and your loss function, how that progressed through the training. Graphs will be good for inspecting the model architecture and projector will be used to visualize the uh, space uh, or the embedding space. So if we go to time series here, you will see the points from the first epoch on the validation metrics. Now we have a lot of runs, so maybe we can ref just run them. Uh, ah, I don't know, <laughs> it didn't work. But we can at least see them here and you can see that in Magenta here, you have the validation loss. Oh, this is the training loss. And in the dark blue here, you have the uh, validation accuracy. Sorry, yeah, this is the training accuracy and you have the validation accuracy. And it's quite hard to see when you just run for one epoch here and you have some multiple versions of runs. But if we go to this pre-made notebook, uh, I can show you guys how it usually looks like when you train for a long amount of epochs. You can see here in Magenta the validation accuracy and you can see the training accuracy in purple how as the training progresses we sort of reach a stage where we no longer improve on the validation loss so eventually we stop the training early compared to the eight epochs we specified because we don't improve it anymore and we can also look at the loss function here as well and then you can apply a smoothing for example if you have a very um, noisy training uh, training step to have an easier time inspecting it. We can also, if we go back here, take a look at our, our architecture. So here you can see this, this is very similar to what George showed, but now that we are a bit more in power, in control of how we're configuring our network, it might be good to always go back here when you've uh, created a new configuration and just make sure. So for example, if you added a new layer uh, for the CNNs, you could go here in TensorBoard and you could have a look at the sequential part to make sure that you have as many convolutional layers as you specified in the config to make sure that everything looks uh, as you want as you want it to and then we have the sort of 
cool part of this uh, tensor board, which is the projector where you can visualize the embedding space. So here I have something that looks very similar to what we got in the example picture in the beginning of this part, where we have this uh, sort of blob with sprite images in a three dimensional uh, embedding space. And this is not what it fully looks like. Usually embedding spaces is a bit more high dimensional than three dimensions. So what we've done here is that TensorBoard will apply some dimension reduction using methods such as PCA, TSNE, or UMAP to get it down to three or two dimensions. So it's easier for humans to interpret. But bear in mind that in this picture or in this uh, space, for example, we're only describing about 36% of the variance. But it's still quite good because if we, for example, add this uh, color map for the labels, you can see that in each of the edges, you sort of have different clothing types. So here, for example, we have a lot of t-shirts, but we've also have other types of upper body garments. And if we go here, we have pants. And in this sort of nice uh, transition, we can see that we go from lower body garments and trousers to dresses, which are a combination of upper and lower body. And then we have upper body garments over here, and we have shoes over here. Uh, let's see. We have shoes over here, and you have sneakers, sandals, and ankle boots. And they can be, they are different types, but they are still lower, they're still footwear uh, clothing. So it would make sense that they are close together. And we can also use different types of methods, as I mentioned before. So for example, if we use UMAP, uh, we can use this to visualize it in a different way. So this time it will find some nearest neighbors and then to perform some optimization, but it shouldn't take too long to do this. Uh, but bear in mind, if you're doing this on your own, it might take longer uh, the first time. So we are about halfway done. And this is uh, actually a good way that, so let's say you want to present how your model is working to your stakeholders. Maybe they're skeptical about how it works. You could show it some more quality, you could show them some more qualitative um, demonstrations using these uh, embedding spaces. For example, here we have uh, at least separated the classes from each other quite far. So for example, you can see here we have all of the pants uh, are their own sort of blob, and then you have all of the shoe wear in their own type of blob, but they're still quite well separated. And if you look over here, we have the bags. And then if you look at the upper body garments, they are a bit blurry or not blurry, but they are quite mixed in together. They're not, it's not that good separation except for maybe t-shirts. So if you were to show this to stakeholders, you could say that, yeah, I expect our model to perform really well on the bags and the trousers and shoe wear, but it might have problems in uh, separating, for example, if we take a look here, for example, it might have a problem separating, a, a, let's say a pullover from a shirt or, or something like that. Uh, so that's some good qualitative analysis that you could show to your stakeholders if, to just show some more explainability for your model. So that's some of the cool stuff you can do with TensorBoard. And I also want to show a little bit of what we do here at H&M. Uh, so one of the projects we're running right now is for to do uh, information enrichment. And this essentially means that we are using uh, AI to classify garments to assign them keywords. So it will be easier to search for them if you're a customer or if you're uh, yeah, working internally. And the way that we do this from the image side is that we're using images and CNNs where we train a CNN model to sort of classify different keywords. And we're do, then combining this with other things to, yeah, to yield these uh, classified keyword and assigning those. Uh, so here I have some examples. I have uh, where we're trying to classify sleeve length based on these uh, images. And the classes that we're using is sleeveless, short sleeve, three quarter sleeve, long sleeve, and extra long sleeve. So the sleeve types gets progressively longer. So for an easy uh, example, we have this hoodie here where you can see that it's, it's quite easy to tell that it's, uh, it's a long sleeve shirt. And you can see that it's labeled as uh, long sleeve and it's predicted as long sleeve. And which is what we expect. And we've also included the, the confidence scores from the network where we can see what the output from the softmax layer is, which will give us the output in probabilities, how likely uh, the network, or how sure the network is that it's this label. And we can see here that in the easy case, the model is very sure. It's around 96.6% sure that it's a long sleeve uh, shirt we're looking at. 
But then we can have a hard case where we have this uh, dress and dresses. Uh, it's quite funny, actually. We discovered when we trained these models that the CNS will use some sort of clue to estimate the sleeve length based on where the waistline is. So if you have a hoodie, it's quite easy to see, OK, the waist should be around here. There are, of course, examples that could differ, but most of the hoodies have their the waist is around here. And if they, it's the same uh, relative length as the, the sleeve, then it will say, oh, that's a long sleeve. But in this case, when you have a dress, this sort of sash will be the clue for where the waist is. But in dresses, this sash could be placed in different spots. It doesn't have to be at uh, like the, the waist. And because of this, it will think that this is the waist and since the sleeves go way past that, oh, maybe this is a, an extra long sleeve, but it's actually been labeled as a three quarter sleeve. And there are, of course, you could use different images to visualize this, but it, what's fascinating is that the model at itself will admit that it's not too sure. It's only 40% confident that it's an extra long sleeve. And it's 32% sure that it could be three quarter sleeve and 27% that it's long sleeve. So it's sort of evenly spread out about along the three possible classes. And I think if you as a human would inspect this image and try to classify it, you might probably guess one of these three too. And it's quite hard to see that it's three quarter sleeve, I think, unless you see the garment worn by a human, uh, which is a cool thing. Uh, yeah, so I think that concludes the second part. And I'm sure Marco and George has some more interesting stuff to, to show. Thank you, David. Thank you for this uh, very interesting second part of the tutorial where we went through an image classification task using a convolutional neural network, which is kind of the workhorse of deep learning, the one with most uh, widespread use in industry, the model, uh, deep learning based model with most widespread use in industry. Uh, we saw like a more advanced uh, usage of a tensor board where we could also visualize uh, embeddings. And now I believe we have, uh, we have uh, all uh, what it takes to go to the third part of the tutorial where we will uh, solve a classification part on uh, data which has uh, a graph structure. More in detail, we will have uh, a link prediction uh, task and uh, George will uh, drive us through that part of the tutorial, so I let him have the stage. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, so the part three. Part three is link prediction on a data set called Collab. But before explaining what is Collab, uh, why we focus on this specific part and what, why we, we included this part. So when we go to real case scenarios and uh, more advanced data sets, we, uh, we have more complicated data. More complicated data does not mean just more dimensions on the features or more dimensions on the images or bigger images or something more complex, but it means also uh, relational information between the different uh, data points. So in this case, we're going to see an, a data set which has a very similar structure which is uh, called Collab. And what, they, what it consists of is authors and uh, their collaborations between uh, different papers. So what we see is that we have a data set which says author one with author two have been uh, part, uh, share the same um, paper. They have been published the same paper in uh, this year. And we have a lot of combinations like this. So the most natural way to represent this kind of data is nothing else but uh, a graph. What is a graph? A graph consists of two main things, nodes and edges. edges. In this case, we choose to uh, represent the nodes as the authors and the edges will just connect the authors that have been co-authors, that meaning that they have published a paper together in the specific year. So the edge contains not just one uh, feature like 01, but it also contains uh, the year information. For this part, uh, for, and simplify the project, we just uh, convert to 01, but uh, this information of the year can be also used to, for other, other, other things. The, the data set is hosted in OGB. OGB stands for Open Graph Benchmark. Why we use OGB for this part and why we use in general OGB uh, for representing the graph structures. 
OGB is uh, a framework uh, which can support um, big graphs. First of all, it contains already some small, medium, and large graphs for machine learning, which can be used for uh, research purposes. And uh, what we can do is that we can just uh, store something in OGB and then we can retrieve it where OGB is compatible with some uh, deep learning frameworks for uh, graphs. One of them is DGL, the other one is PyTorch uh, Geometric, and uh, it can provide data loaders so it can feed the data directly to these uh, specific uh, frameworks. Another thing that is very interesting in uh, OGB, maybe we can jump to OGB, is that uh, it contains leaderboards. So leaderboards uh, for the different data sets, there are three kinds of data sets, no property, link property, and graph property. What we're going to see is a link property data set. And if we go to the collab, we can see that uh, they have defined some metric. And then based on this metric, we can see which method, which paper, and which code has achieved um, best uh, performance, which, what has been tried and what has not been tried. So we can keep track of what's happening uh, uh, in the research and uh, which models perform better or worse uh, for this kind of data. So if we go jump, if we jump back, what we are going to use, uh, as I spoiled already, is the link prediction part. So we need to uh, fo focus on the OGBL collab data set. And what they have done in the OGB, like uh, how they store the data, they store that uh, to the nodes. They represent the average word embedding of the papers that the authors have published. And the edges is just the connection between the authors that have been, pub been co-authors published together a paper per year. This kind of data sets and this kind of representations are much harder to solve with uh, regular uh, deep learning uh, layers and models. So one of the bigger difference is that a node can have many, many neighbors, and that is an arbitrary number compared to pixels, for example, in image. When you have a pixel image, you know that you have a fixed number of uh, neighbors, except if you are on the four corners or on the edges. For the nodes, it's not like this. So this thing becomes very hard because traditional ways where you can do minibus, for example, when the data set is very big and you cannot fit in the memory, you have to apply mini batch techniques so you can split it in smaller uh, smaller parts. Here, if you do that, you have to decide, for example, let's say you split with respect to the nodes. So if you split with respect to the nodes, then the graph will have, uh, if you, for example, you have graph with 10 nodes, one to 10, and then five is connected with 12, then the edge of one, five connected to 12 is lost, is missed, is missing. So in this case, uh, they have some techniques and some graph neural networks uh, which have been introduced, which can apply the same logic with and without mini batch uh, on this uh, kind of structured data. So one of the uh, models that we're going to use is called GCN. It stands for Graph Convolution Network. And it has a very similar behavior to what uh, David showed earlier, the convolution part just uh, with some uh, modifications so it can be applied on graphs for uh, this uh, specific uh, representation. In this case, we chose to use uh, DGL for uh, as a deep learning framework on graphs. So we get the DGL, uh, the, we get the graph convolution network implementation or model from the DGL. And the reason that we chose DGL is because DGL can um, use as backend both PyTorch and TensorFlow giving us much flexibility when we want to uh, experiment with different things or transition from one to the other framework. And DGL uh, does not only support with the graph neural networks, but it is also supported with some tools which we can use to manipulate and modify the, the graphs. It's something that we can see for sure in the code uh, later, but yeah, it, it supports, uh, it has a lot of uh, functionalities. So the model that uh, we chose to use for this uh, specific uh, task uh, for, for solving the specific problem is called SEAL. And I, we just chose it from the leaderboard. As you see, SEAL is uh, one of the models that performs uh, very good. And uh, what is SEAL? SEAL, first of all, stands for learning from subgraphs, embeddings, and attributes for in prediction. 
why let, maybe first let's speak about why lean prediction is under a, a tutorial which is for lean, uh, for classification the reason is that lean prediction is just predicting zero one zero one means a binary thing and uh, we can represent a link prediction problem as a classification problem with only two labels as we saw in the first part so what seal does so it can solve link prediction problems so seal uh, consists of a GCN layer, or actually multiple GCN layers. So we can have some GCN layers, which are very good to generate strong embeddings, embeddings similar to what uh, David showed earlier. And these representations are used in a short pooling layer, which this short pooling layer can be used for uh, shorting the nodes with respect to some criteria. And then we can use uh, CNN or a few CNN layers. And finally, an MLP which tries to classify if that one is, uh, if there's a link or not between the nodes. How we represent that and why, what, what SEAL does, so uh, why SEAL uh, performs so well. So SEAL, the innovation of the SEAL model is that they just add one extra dimension in the node features, which represent the position of the nodes in the graph with respect to the source and the destination. I mean, you want to check if author one with author two have been collaborated. So we just add extra information on the nodes and then we create subgraphs which can fit in the memory, otherwise they don't fit in the memory. We take the embeddings from the GCN and the short pooling, then we apply the CNN and then we can take on the MLP a classification between zero and one if the edge exists between the two authors. So for this implementation, uh, there is some work being reused so here you can see the papers and the, and the GitHub links for these uh, specific uh, papers. And uh, what we did in this case is that in, for part three, we just follow again the same way, but this example, so this uh, code were not in PyTorch Lightning. So what we did, we convert this code to PyTorch Lightning so we can have the same structure for all the projects, uh, even for this something, or even for this part, which is more complicated. So let's, just see what's happening in high level in the different stages so again we have the data the model the trainer so in the data part maybe i will start from the trainer because the trainer is exactly let me zoom good so the trainer is exactly the same as we saw earlier like it has ex the same callbacks etc the only difference is that uh, since in the leaderboard they have defined uh, hits as a metric what we did, we just include uh, another model checkpoint with respect to the hits. So we check the best hits and we have to check that this is have to be maximized compared to the uh, checkpoint that we had earlier, the loss checkpoint, which was checking the validation loss and the mode was minimized. So that's the only different thing. Um, let's go now to the things that are different for this uh, specific part. So first for the graph. So for the graph, uh, here we have the Colab data module, which again inherits from the PyTorch Lightning data module. And in this case, we have the init as we had before, which we initialize the data set. Then we have the preparation of the data set. That's something that we didn't see earlier, but it ran the background from what uh, David showed. So when you run the data set for the first time, prepared data will run only once even if you do distributed uh, training, it will run only once, so you can download and the data and save them somewhere. So what, that's what we do here. So here we use the OGB uh, 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 provider of the data the, to the DGL, since we use DGL, and then uh, we'll save the data to the specific path. And then what we have is the setup, as we had before, which takes the stages, and then uh, since that one has been saved, that one can be called as many times we want, and uh, we can call uh, for fit, validation, test, and predict. So I, I won't go in much detail in this part, but I want to just to show you that what we did is to simplify the case. So we use um, uh, we, we use only one uh, information on the edge, zero one, and uh, what we do we create the different. Uh, state and data set data load data sets and data loaders accordingly for train feed test and uh, predict so why somebody can ask why we have predict here since 
how can we know what happens on, on, on unknown uh, years? So let me just jump back and I will explain what I mean. So what you see here is that um, So here, what we see is that the the OGB has split the data set in such a way so the years 160, one, uh, 1963 until 2017 has been used for training the data. Then the year 2018 has been used to validate the, the, the model. And then after choosing the best model with respect to what happened in 2018, what we can do, we can aggregate this information. So we can go from 1963 until 2018 to test on the 2019. And this is what the performance that we get here is the performance that is uh, reporting the leaderboard. What we did uh, as uh, just to show how we can do something in production is that we also aggregate the 2019 information uh, uh, to the previous one. So we have from 1960, 1963 until 2019. And we try to predict on 2020, which uh, we don't know what happened based on the data set. But in the same way, by doing that recursively, we can predict every year or every month what's happening. So that's what I wanted to mention about the predict part. And uh, again, uh, there is some functionality here. There are some functions which just show you how to sum sample the graph, how to generate these graphs, and etc. But the same, the structure is again the same. We always have the data set from PyTorch with the init, the length, the gate item, and then we put it to the uh, data module. Now let's go to the model part. So for the model part, uh, this is very similar to what uh, David showed earlier. So in this case, we have this uh, deep graph convolution neural network, which uh, consists of what uh, of actually is the implementation of SIM and consists of what uh, I explained earlier, but maybe it's easy if we can just check it one more time. So what's happening in this uh, specific uh, part? So I would just go to the forward. So first we get the node embeddings and the edges information. And then what we can do, we can just generate node embeddings from the GCN. Then we can apply an activation function for uh, breaking the linearity. And then we can do the short pooling then we do the CNN and then we do the MLP, which provides us with some probability, uh, which specifies if the, uh, there is a link or not between the two authors. And here we do exactly the same thing as we saw earlier, defining the model, defining the param, sorry, maybe that's better, defining the, the optimizers and uh, the forward, the training step, and exactly returning some information, which we can use later for computing accuracy, computing uh, heats, etc. And then what we can do, we can aggregate all this information and uh, save them in the tensor board. So I want to show you how to run that, and then we can see how the model performs. So as we saw before, uh, we have the CUDA version. Here I install a specific uh, CUDA version because it's uh, faster, otherwise it will take a lot of time to, to train this uh, specific model. Then what we do, uh, as before, we clone and install, uh, we clone the repo and install it. So we install the zero to here package. And uh, then we import the same, uh, the same things as we saw earlier and uh, make sure for reproducibility, uh, make sure for the reproducibility. And then what I did here is that in Collab, it's very big. Uh, this data set is very big for Collab. So what I did, I just take 10% uh, of each for the training and 10% uh, of each. I call it test, but it actually is validation test and uh, ratio. I use the same one for both. And But if you want to check with these things, you can always check them in the configuration in the same way that uh, David showed earlier. So if I go to here, configs, and collab, you will see the same thing. So we have the data where you can define uh, if you want to add the validation edges, etc. If you want to change the ratios, then you have the model, which consists again from the graph part, the convolution part, as uh, David showed earlier, the short pooling now, and the linear part, and then the hyperparameters. And if you run that one, uh, we can see that the model is trained for a few epochs. 
In this case, because it was more complicated, what I chose is to have some verbose. Verbose means that I can get some uh, extra information, some feedback for what's happening inside. So every time that we get a better performance, we get a message. Like, uh, or when we don't get a better for performance, we also get a message. So we know when the model actually improves. Then we can see how the model performs on the on the uh, test part. Probably you see that this is a very bad per, uh, performance compared to what is what exists in the leaderboard. But don't forget, I just used 10% of the data just to make it work in the collab. Later, we can see what's happening on 2020 by aggregating all the previous information. And what I did, I just chose a few uh, combinations, one, two, three, four, five, uh, uh, five uh, combinations. And then I check if these authors will collaborate in 2020. And as we see, all of these five random things that I choose, it's just false, false, false. And finally, we can check how it looks in TensorBoard. But I will go to the other TensorBoard, which I have run. So here, I run it twice just to show you uh, with different parameters. And then you can see how it performs. So as you see, the training is almost the same. And uh, here we can see how the validation accuracy improves. Of course, for a better representation, we can use a smoothing uh, technique. And then uh, we can check also how the heats in, uh, behave. So we can see that the model becomes better in the heats. Then we can check the loss, how the loss goes. And because um, something that I didn't mention earlier, when we have graphs, when we have to predict edges, zero, one, something that we have to keep in mind is that we need to take uh, into consideration also that you have positive edges and negative edges. Some edges are one, some negative edges are zero. And most of the edges in a graph, because the edges are n squared when you have n nodes, uh, are mostly negative. So the model is biased to predict negative. And that can be also seen by checking independently the accuracy in the loss on the neg and the positive part. So what we see is that here's how the model behaves in the negative part. Here is uh, the loss, accuracy and loss. But if we go to the positive, we see that it's not so uh, so good. So the model has um, uh, some difficulty to learn the positive part. And by closing this part, uh, I, there are techniques if somebody is interested to see how we can fix that. And I have one small technique for that. If you go to the model, you can see that we can assign uh, more weight on the positive part so you can have more uh, importance when you predict wrong or correct in the uh, in the positive part and finally i would like to conclude by what we do in h&m with these graph neural networks and these graph structures so as you know h&m is one uh, of the biggest retail fashion retailers which uh, con which has a lot of uh, hundreds of thousands of products and one problem that we try to solve back then is the compatibility problem about between the two products. So one paper has been introduced. It's called this context-aware visual and compatibility prediction, which we have taken this image. And as we can see here is that uh, there, are, there are a lot of models in the deep learning literature where they can just say, this product is compatible with this product. This product is compatible with this product. But there are not so many pro. Uh, and deep learning approaches or techniques, methods that can say what will be the probability of two items being compatible by conditioning on a context. And that's what this paper does. So here we can see that by representing the products as a graph and then the edges as uh, compatibility formation, zero, one, the graph benefit is that we can aggregate the information from the neighbors. So if we know that this product is already connected with these products and this product is connected with these products, then we can say that uh, we can choose easier which shoe, uh, pair of shoes goes best and uh, based on the compatibility score that we get from conditioning on the contextualized part. And uh, we are happy to announce that we have uh, a paper uh, published Publish a paper, inductive learning uh, for product assortment graph completion, completion. And from this paper, you can see uh, how we use more uh, advanced techniques to enrich uh, graphs with uh, for solving these kind of tasks. And I give the road bar to Marco. All right, thank you, George. This was a very nice presentation. 
So just to wrap up this uh, tutorial, like um, we went through uh, a zero to hero approach for uh, solving classification tasks using deep learning. In the first part of the tutorial, we did classification on a small synthetic data set just to set the stage and to introduce the, um, the tools we are using among which uh, TensorBoard and PyTorch Lightning. Second part, uh, classification of images, one of the um, workhorses of deep learning, convolutional neural network was used there. And then we went to part three, where it's uh, classification, like lean prediction of uh, data with a graph structure, where we saw among the most advances uh, application of deep learning. And uh, together with uh, showing you something we hope uh, to be interesting for you, we also try to give you a feeling of uh, the type of work we do at uh, h and uh, AI Research by showing you our interest for uh, yeah, research in deep learning together with uh, code quality and um, all the life cycle aspects of uh, of uh, AI project in an industrial settings. Plus, as uh, George has pointed out in the, at the end, we also publish papers, which uh, because we want to kind of become a well-known actor into AI research. And uh, this concludes the tutorial. And uh, we will be here for a few more minutes to be able to answer your questions that you can post uh, on the YouTube channel as our conference organizers just pointed out there. Thank you very much. I'll uh, keep watching the, the thread of comments and I'll uh, yeah, work as moderator asking uh, either George or David to, to answer whatever question shows up. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can mention as well, if you're watching the video version of this, so you're not watching it live, uh, feel free to post an issue with the correct label on the GitHub if you if you're stuck and you need help, and we'll try to answer it when we have time. Good, David. That was a perfect addition. And uh, yes, I don't see any question popping up yet. So I wonder whether there is something we would like to tell a bit more in the meanwhile we wait for questions um, something i can probably point out is a bit of a of a theoretical uh, link between uh, like images and graphs like uh, at the end of the day, if you think about what uh, David showed you, which is a convolution operator on an image where you have a fixed neighborhood, which can be like uh, uh, defined as four neighbors, so only the pixels which are above, below, left, and right, but also as eight neighbors with also the diagonal. What we can think about uh, like a graph convolutional neural network is that is a generalization of that to uh, like uh, images, uh, graphs, uh, where you don't actually have this regularity in the neighborhood, but the neighborhood are defined by links. And that's what makes it much harder that you cannot assume, okay, my pixel will uh, always have a neighborhood that looks the same because your node, which is the corresponding of a pixel in a graph, will have a, every time a different neighborhood. And therefore, you need to have software modules that can cope with that.
think I can also mention some fairly exciting research that's been going on uh, fairly recently is that we're actually starting to move away from convolutional networks when you're doing computer vision because there's been a lot of work done into modifying transformers to use that for computer vision tasks and they're starting to beat a lot of the state of the art and benchmarks that the con uh, convolutional neural networks uh, set a long time ago so that's fairly exciting so if you are interested in the field i recommend you to check up on transformers and the work that's going on there nice and then uh, one more comment on that direction is that what we showed you in this tutorial is something which is uh, quite close to textbook knowledge if you if you read some textbook on machine learning with image processing or it's it's a rather textbook kind of knowledge but in our uh, ai research at h m we work together with uh, universities to be able to kind of stay as close as possible to the state of the art in these uh, disciplines and uh, to eventually even push the state of the art in a direction which would be beneficial for H&M. All right, we got a question in the chat from FW. Have you checked how the model behaves on varying the camera or the camera angle and the camera color adjustment? And uh, I guess I can answer to this. Well, the answer is no, because uh, we do the camera, the image uh, recognition. Uh, in other words, how do you normalize the pictures? Well, uh, I can say that our pictures are already normalized because they come from uh, from photo shooting, which are uh, uh, taken for the sake of uh, advertising uh, our products mainly on the website. So if you go on uh, H&M website and you click on the images, the one showing the garment in its entirety without a model, that's the kind of picture we are uh, using in our, uh, in our work, both with uh, convolutional neural networks, but also with graph neural networks. Uh, I hope this answers. I think we can add a comment as well. That's uh, if you. That's a bit more philosophical as well. Is that uh, usually it's quite important that you make sure that the image images that you train on and that you send uh, try to predict on uh, that they are similar in nature, and that is what we have tried to achieve with the way that we do things at H and M. So. We are quite confident that the images that we take that we are using will look very similar to the images that we will later predict because it's usually um, we take the photo in the same way for most of clothing. Uh, but if that would were to be different, then I think a lot of the assumptions that we can make with a model sometimes is not tr entirely applicable because then you get into domain transfer and that's a whole field of research in itself. Exactly. And uh, yeah, maybe in the meanwhile, we wait for more questions. I would like to give a special mention to George because uh, he is the ideator of this uh, tutorial and uh, the person who did the most of the coding. So thank you, George, for doing this and making this uh, possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. If there are no questions coming now, I'm pretty sure that you can still reach out to Marco, George, and David. Uh, what is the best channel to uh, contact you? uh linkedin all right <laughs> <laughs> so everybody watching you have the names here make sure to find them on linkedin then it's from my side to say thank you a lot uh for this workshop um 
or like walk through a tutorial on how to classify with deep learning. Really, really exciting topic. And I bet uh, a lot of you out there uh, will make good use of it and hopefully learn a lot. So thanks again and uh, see you around. Thank you, Christine, <laughs> for giving us the opportunity to present. And Thank see you, you later. Thank you. Take care. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.